If I told you that I had spent time and knew one of the most famous, instantly recognized people in the world, if you knew me well enough to invade my private space, first of all to ask me who that was on the assumption that the statement was true, I think you would then go on to ask two questions. The first would be, well, how long have you known them? Because that would be an indication of probably how well you knew them. And then the second question would be like unto the first question, you would say to me, what are they really like? What are they really like? Think about those questions in connection with our Lord Jesus Christ. How long have you known Him? Probably for many of us, relatively easy to answer. But the second question is a little more testing, isn't it? Tell me what He is really like. Tell me what He is really like. It's a question that uh, arose, isn't it, in the upper room in John 14, immediately following the words that Dr. Moeller was citing, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, the question arises, uh, Jesus uh, show us the Father. Uh, this is a disciple who's been with Jesus, we think, for about three years, and you remember Jesus' response to him, have you known me so long time, Philip, yet you do not know who I really am? So, if a non-Christian asks you, indeed, if a Christian asks you, tell me what Jesus is really like. I don't mean give me the theology. That is to say the categories of interpretation, which I don't think anyone would doubt I regard as of immense value, but were to ask the question, what is He really like? How, how well would you do with the answer? Um, I was imagining a, a Bible study as Dr. Muller was speaking, um, in which the Bible study leader asked the question, what is Jesus really like? And I, I could see uh, Mrs. McDonald and her husband Joe in the corner smiling at one another, and Mrs. McDonald saying, well, and looking at Joe, who always does what Mrs. McDonald says, well, the way Joe and I like to think about Jesus is, and she has no idea, she's a child of the Enlightenment. And it's hard for the Bible study to lead her de to say, dear, uh, the way you like to think about Jesus is utterly irrelevant. The real question is, what is Jesus really like? Not just how do you like to think about Jesus, but what is Jesus really like? And these verses at the end of Matthew chapter 11 stand out in Matthew's gospel. In a sense, they stand out in the synoptic gospels as a place in which in a very singular, striking way, the Lord Jesus Himself tells us what He is like. This is what I am like. This is who I am. This is what you will find in me. This is what you will discover from me. This you will experience in me. This is Jesus' own answer to the question, Jesus, what are you really like? And I'm using the present tense. I'm not asking the question, what was Jesus like? I'm predicating the question on the basis of Hebrews 13 verse 8. 
He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is not longhand, for Jesus is eternal, true though that is. That's a statement underlining that the Jesus of whom we read here in the Gospels as He was yesterday, from the perspective of the author of Hebrews, as He was yesterday, so He is today, and so He is tomorrow. So this is what Jesus is like. And he's inviting us in, as it were, into his own self-interpretation of who he is and what he is like. It's an astonishing statement, really. There's a kind of, there's a kind of paradox written into the very things that he says about himself. He, he, is, he is meek and lowly in heart, and yet this is one of the places where he says, I am meek and lowly in heart. If I say that to you, I am meek and lowly in heart, you say to me, you are lying through your teeth. Or you would never say that kind of thing. You have no self-knowledge. But he is the one who has perfect knowledge of himself, opening himself to those who are listening to him, who are burdened and who are heavy laden, and he is, he is telling us who he really is. And the, the implication of that is, is if, we, if we don't know Him like this, we still do not know Him. How long have I been with you, and yet you still do not know me, Philip? And the way, of course, that, that emerges in our lives is the degree to which we are unlike Him because it's part of the dynamic of relationships between people, that the people we come to know best are the people that we become most like. So, how does Jesus tell us who He is? Well, let me pick out three of the strands of His teaching in these verses for us to explore together for a few minutes this morning. We, we know what Jesus is like, first of all, by the invitation that He offers us. The invitation is, come to Me. But what's interesting about the invitation is those to whom the invitation is extended. Um, at times in my life, teaching in theological seminaries, I've had inquisitive students coming up to me and saying, if you were able to have a dinner party at the end of the week, then uh, which four theologians from the history of the church would you invite? Usually kind of surprised by the people who would be at my table. And, you know, we, we'd all ask that kind of question, aren't we? Famous sportsmen are asked, you know, you four of your kind, who would you invite? Now, look at Jesus' guests, those to whom the invitation goes. Come, He says, to Me, you who labor and are heavy laden, you who are weary, you who are burdened. Eh, those are not the people you want as your dinner guests because those people are enormously hard work. Those people are enormously difficult to love. Those people are enormously difficult to draw out, to unpick, to untangle the complexities that make them weary and heavy laden and burdened and sore. But Jesus says that's the people He wants to invite. It's amazing. It tells you so much about the kind of Savior He really is. And it's interesting just to think about this for a moment because the language He uses is deliberately general. We're not able to tell from this text 
exactly what was it that burdened these people? What was it that oppressed them and made them feel they were heavy laden, made them feel that they were somehow or another yoked to something that was uncomfortable and irritating and caused friction and distress? We can speculate what it was with these people can speculate that they are socially oppressed, they're, they're under Roman domination, that they're oppressed by taxation and by tax collectors. We can, we can speculate on that, and that they are burdened because they are conscious that they cannot live up to the law of God, never mind the Pharisees' interpretations of the law of God. And I can imagine in our world, people might read a passage like that and say, well, that was fine for them, but it's no longer fine in our society because we have got rid of the law of God. But as you remember, the Apostle Paul points out on more than one occasion when he's writing to Gentiles who do not have the law of God, his basic response to them is, you may not have the written law of God but you cannot escape having been created as the image of God. And so long as you're the image of God, created to function according to the law of God, then there will manifest itself in your life the same kind of weariness, the same kind of burden because of what the Scriptures call your sin and your iniquity, your transgression, your rebellion, or what you may experience as your failure. And it's interesting, isn't it, when people have the integrity, as some academics have had, to bring out the statistics that result from our throwing away the law of God, and all the energy and the expense that now goes into teaching young people who have no sense of who they are, because they've never been reared in the undergirding significance of being created as the image of God for the joy of God, for the presence of God, and for the glory of God. Every single substitute that our Western governments put in its place. You can be anything you want. You are a prince. You are a princess. Billions in the Western world spent on raising people out of their sense of failure and simply accelerating their sense of failure. I rather suspect there has not been so much self-harming in the Western world since there were monks living in monasteries seeking to deal with their sinfulness by self-harming. And while the world knows it by other names, it's exactly what Jesus is speaking about here. And if you think of the order of these messages this morning, you can see the coherence of this, that there is no other one in whom dignity can be restored, from whom burdens that we feel can be taken away than the one who is meek and lowly in heart and who is able to give us rest for our souls, from our sense of failure, from our sense of guilt. This is a wound our society cannot heal, and the more the individual and the society seeks to heal it by its self-inventions, the worse it makes the wound, the harder becomes the yoke to bear. And our grandchildren were eyes to say that we cannot bear this burden that our grandparents and parents have placed upon us. So it really means something special to us to be Christians in this world, to know that Jesus is the light of the world, that Jesus alone is the one in whom true truth can be found and to whom we can come because He invites those who are burdened and heavy laden to come to Him. and He will give us rest. I was, happened to be reading a book by Dr. R.C. Sproul 
a couple of weeks ago and came across this nugget. Those of you who ever heard him knew he was the kind of man to whom things happened. There are some preachers to whom things happened and they see it, and there are more preachers to whom things happen and they don't see it. And so it never appears in their illustrations. And he was telling a, a story that I'd never heard from him that at one point a psychiatrist with a very large and successful practice had offered him a job and a fortune to take the job in his psychiatric practice. And R.C. said, but I'm not a psychiatrist. And the psychiatrist said, that doesn't matter. He said, about 95% of my patients do not need a psychiatrist. They need a priest who will tell them how to find the forgiveness of their sins, the release from their shame and their guilt that will deliver them from the burden that is crushing them that my colleagues mis-exegete and therefore misfunction in their diagnosis and in their prescription. And it's in the papers all the time, isn't it, in the NHS, that the burden about over-prescription of drugs is partly a financial matter, but it's more than a financial matter. It's the recognition that actually, unless the problem is biochemical, putting chemicals in is not going to heal the problem. But here is our Lord Jesus Christ. One day He will remove all these burdens. One day we will no longer be weary. Even the oldest person in the room will no longer be weary. But even now He says, if you're burdened, heavy laden, come to Me and I will give you rest. And that, of course, is the second thing to notice that he says. There's the invitation that he offers us, and then there's the promise that he makes to us. I will give you rest. I will give you rest. What does he mean? I'm, I'm, back, to the, I'm back to the same question. I know what he says, but what does he mean? And I, I hear Mrs. MacDonald again saying, well, the way, the way Joe and I like to think of, about it is, and I'm usually too embarrassed to say, go and make the tea. <laughs> so what does Jesus mean? How would we find out what Jesus meant? How would you find out what Jesus meant when He said, come to Me and I'll give you rest? Not by looking up the dictionary, but by coming to understand Jesus' biblical theology. So let me take a few minutes to, to delve into the way in which I believe Jesus must have understood the Scriptures that enabled Him to say, I exclusively will give you rest, and when I say rest, you know what I'm talking about. Because rest, if you think about it, rest in God, the rest of our souls that we abide in God, and the resting of creation so that it functions as a perfect creation of God where, where there are where there are no irritations uh, in the way in which the cosmos functions. Uh, rest was how God created the world. Indeed, He created the world with so much rest that on the seventh day He was able to rest, wasn't He? But I wonder if you ever thought about it like this. The day of rest which was the seventh day, was Adam's first day. Isn't that right? He was created on the sixth day. He apparently went to sleep twice. One occasion, this beautiful woman appears. The other occasion, the seventh day appears. And he begins his life resting. You know, many of our forefathers believed it was on the day of rest that Adam fell, the very first day. 
Man did not abide for a single day was the text they tended to hang it on. And actually, the narrative gives you that impression that he is created in a world that is functioning so beautifully. He's given this woman to live in harmony. He's given this world to enjoy. He is told that there is work to do because he's put in a garden and he's to extend that garden to the ends of the earth, and the next day is the Sabbath. And it's a kind of indication to them that they are to live the whole of their working life with their family extending the garden to the ends of the earth out of a position of rest. And we even understand that, don't we? That it's only from a strong position of stability and rest that we can create energy and force. Otherwise, everything is unstable. And so, from one point of view, we might say that in the sights and the crosshairs of the serpent, there is the destruction of the rest, the harmony between them and the heavenly Father, the harmony between each other, the harmony between them and the cosmos. And the whole of the rest of the Bible narrative is a story of the restlessness of our sinful condition with the promise that one would come who would bring rest. It would, be, it would be a rest that would be bought at a bloody price, Genesis 3.15. And you remember a couple of chapters later on when Noah's parents of their baby boy, you remember why they called him Noah? The name Noah sounds very like the Hebrew verb for rest. And do you remember what they said about him? Perhaps this is the one who will bring rest. And they weren't just making that up. They were understanding what they knew of divine revelation. God had promised a redeemer, a conqueror, who would restore rest, and they were desperately hoping their baby boy might be that seed of the woman who would bruise and crush the head of the serpent, even as his own heel was crushed and bruised. And there was a sense in which, out of judgment, there was a new rest created through Noah, but it disintegrated again. Remember how the picture of the exodus is of God bringing them out of their bondage under the yoke of slavery. You see that background in what Jesus is saying here, and He brings them into the land of rest. He makes a covenant with them. And isn't, it's, it's often a puzzle to people, why is it that the sign of that Mosaic covenant is what? It's the Sabbath. Not just the weekly Sabbath, but the, the Sabbath Sabbaths, the six years and then the seventh, and then the, the seven seven years and the year of Jubilee. And, and what God is doing is creating for them a kind of pop-up picture book in which they can't move in the week or in the years or in the half centuries without being reminded that what God has promised in His great gospel promise is that He will bring rest. But all of these things are but signs of a reality that is not fulfilled in the Exodus. Remember how Isaiah gives the interpretation of it in Isaiah 63, how the Spirit brought them into a land of rest, but they rebelled against Him. And uh, just as we sometimes sing at Christmas, if we sing Christmas carols, O little town of Bethlehem, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in Thee tonight. And when Jesus says, come to me, you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, He's saying the hopes and the fears of all the centuries, the fulfillment of all the promises. I am the one in whom the promises of God are yes and amen. And this promise that God gave in Genesis 3.15, His oldest promise in Scripture, His most difficult to keep promise in Scripture. 
His longest lasting promise in Scripture is being fulfilled in me. I am that rest to which all those shadows pointed. You remember how in Luke's gospel, when he's discussing with Moses and Elijah significantly, the, the death he's going to die in Jerusalem, you remember how Luke uses the word, the exodus that he would accomplish? Because he's going to bring rest. Now, how does our Lord Jesus bring rest? Well, there are, there are two aspects to the way in which He does it, aren't there? He does it, first of all, by entering into the deepest darkness of our restlessness. And the, the gospel writers, especially Mark, bring this out in very powerful terms. As, they, as, as Mark sees Jesus going into the Garden of Gethsemane and describes Jesus' experience in the Garden of Gethsemane, he uses violently emotional language about what Jesus was going through. His soul was sorrowful, troubled. And, and Mark says that, that Jesus began to be filled with sorrow and was greatly distressed. I've never forgotten the day when I was a, a student, um, and I came across a, a great Anglican scholar from the 19th century, totally sane New Testament scholar of legendary ability and status. And he comments on the fact that the very same verb is used in Philippians chapter 2, verse 29 of, a, of Epaphroditus. who was sick out of his mind because he'd heard that his own people had heard that he was sick. He was like your mother. Your, your, your mother was more worried that the family were worried that she was sick than she was worried about being sick. And Paul uses exactly the same verb, and, he, and here's what this level-headed Anglican scholar said. He said, this verb describes the overwhelmed, half-distracted state that emerges from physical derangement or mental oppression. I think that's why the gospel writers are at pain to point out that Jesus fell on the ground. And when you watch Him in the Garden of Gethsemane, there's a there is, a, there is a certain sense, and actually it's accentuated after the angel comes to strengthen him, that he is undergoing a restlessness of an unfathomable, unparalleled nature. And the reason, of course, is he's just given the cup of blessing to his disciples in the upper room, and he's just taking from his Father's hand the cup his disciples should be drinking the cup of that terrible restlessness that is the fruit of sin, and He's tasting it to a level none of us has begun to taste it. It's, it's as though He needs to go into the darkest chamber of human restlessness in order to, in His active obedience, take that upon His own shoulders in order in and of Himself to have tasted the fruit of our sinfulness and our restlessness, and on His own shoulders yoked to Him, bring us back to rest in God. And of course, He not only does that, but on the cross He deals with the cause of that restlessness. As Isaiah saw, He would be wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement that would bring us peace, shalom for our restlessness. He tasted, and with His stripes we are made whole. It's interesting, isn't it, if you… you know the chapter divisions were not written by the gospel writers, so there was… Matthew did not write number 12 here. 
And because somebody wrote number 12 here, we tend to think verse 30 finishes it. But you notice what happens next? At that time, at exactly that time, do you notice what the next two passages are about? They're about Sabbath day controversies in which Jesus is taking people whose lives have been marred by sin on the Sabbath day, and He is recreating them. He's bringing them back to the rest in God for which they had been created. So much so that Matthew actually cites the first of those servant songs that appear in the second half of the prophecy of Isaiah, and you'll notice what he says about him, and uh, he quotes him in chapter 12, verse 19, he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. That's what he's like. It's what He was to be like. It's what He was like. It's what He is like. It's what He will always be like. And He invites us to come to Him. So, there's an invitation and there's a promise. And then, of course, very specially, there's this unique self-description He gives. I am meek and lowly in heart. I don't think I need to spend any time saying meekness is not weakness. Moses, the meekest man in all the earth, leading those endless people through the wilderness. Jesus, speaking these uncomfortable words to people who knew Him. There is no weakness here. But there is the the meekness that is, as it were, forged into a person's being by the way in which they bow themselves to the will of God as He reveals it in His Word and in the harshest providences of life. And this is what Jesus is saying, that that exudes in my personality, meekness. You know, if you've really messed up, you do not want to open your heart to somebody who lacks meekness. You don't want to go to the proudest elder in your congregation or the proudest minister you know or the one who exudes his success ability. You want to go to somebody who's meek and who's lowly in heart. Um, Remember how John in John chapter 13 before Uh, Jesus' discourse gives us that picture of Jesus, lowly in heart, taking the servant's position. Um, The thing that's always moved me most is, is actually something that isn't said in the text, but the text makes clear happened. What's clear in the text is He washed the feet of the person who was going to deny Him. What the text doesn't specifically say, but the flow of the text makes clear, is that He also washed the feet of the one who was going to betray Him. In John's narrative, Judas leaves the room after the feet washing, washing those feet. That's the expression of a lowly heart. That's the expression of one who, as Paul says, did not count equality with God as a a situation that would exclude him from humbling and even humiliation. And he comes and kneels, kneels before his denier, kneels before his betrayer. And he invites us to come because He is the way to the Father. And as we come with Him, I am meek and lowly in heart, He says, come with Me, I'm inviting you. You labor, you're heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Um, Do you notice the words that precede all this? 
not the uncomfortable words, but the words that identify him as to who he is. I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and you've revealed them to babes because this was your gracious will. And then he goes on to say this. It's really staggering. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. And He is coming to the, the poor, the, 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 the humbled, the, the pained, the burdened, the anxious, the distressed, the failed, and the failing. And He's saying, just come with me. And we say, trembling to Him, but where you go into the presence of God, what shall I say? And it's as though He says, just say what I say, Abba, Father. You know, there, was, there is nobody in the Old Testament who ever says that. They lived in days of wonderful revelation, but in days of the shadows, there is not a single saint in the Old Testament who is described as coming to God and saying, Abba, Father. And here is the meanest and poorest believer in this new covenant age. And we think tremblingly of going into the presence of the one who is seated on the throne in all his majesty. And the Lord Jesus says, I've come to make him known to you. So just say what I say. And when we say, Abba, Father, we know that at last we've found rest. But perhaps we're still a little afraid. Uh, Dr. Moeller mentioned C.S. Lewis, great imagination, theology, not so much. Behind C.S. Lewis, as most of you know, lay a Scotsman called George MacDonald. Lewis says he basically didn't ever really write a book without using the thoughts of George MacDonald. Not for theology. But listen to this for imagination in his fantasy called The Golden Key, in which the little girl Tangle eventually meets the old man of the earth who raises a stone in the ground where there's a huge hole that goes plumb down, and the old man of the earth says to Tangle, that's the way. And she looks down and she says, but there are no stairs. And the old man of the earth says, no, there are no stairs. You must throw yourself in. There is no other way. But throwing yourself in means throwing yourself into the arms of Jesus, who invites you to come, because we're all weak, burdened, poor, heavy laden, and He promises to give us rest. Let's throw ourselves into His arms today. Our Heavenly Father, we have tasted so much in these last uh, hours together, too much for us to be able to take in easily or quickly. We thank You for the way in which our Savior, Jesus Christ, has been exalted, and we pray that by Your grace we may catch fresh glimpses of how utterly reliable He is, how utterly reliable for us intellectually, how the gospel is able to stand on its own feet in our world, and we stand in it and the power of its truth and its clear thinking. And we thank You for our Lord Jesus, who has come to raise us up on His shoulders, to yoke us to Himself, to give us a burden in discipleship that fits well, is easy and light, because He is undergirding that burden in His grace. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank You that You are meek and lowly, and that in You alone we find rest for our souls. Hear our praise, receive 
our heart's love. Strengthen us to serve you. We ask it in your name.